Hey, what's up, dude? Uh, nothing much, man. How you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Got up early this morning. Got a nice CrossFit workout in. So um, we've had a great week at Build UI. Unexpectedly good, actually. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's been it's been fun week, and I'm feeling good today. Yeah, yeah. Let's um, let's very quickly talk about Build UI. So we launched uh, lifetime memberships this week, and I know there's there's probably a few of you that are listening to this podcast that are on subscriptions, uh, and we're gonna get everyone that's paid for, for what like two to three months yeah uh, i think we said three months we're going to convert them over two months yep. or one month um we are going to give them a, a, a big discount on uh, the lifetime membership awesome awesome so uh hopefully by the time you hear this you've already gotten an email from me but uh if not uh we're going to take care of that for you so uh, just keep your eye on your inbox yep great message and um I just published, today's Wednesday, April 12th. We usually try to publish these on Wednesday. I just published our, our episode from last week. So uh, if you're interested in some of the technical uh, stuff behind kind of adding lifetime subscriptions to Build UI and how we did it with our stack, that's uh, that's what we published last week. So. Cool. Awesome, man. Cool, so what cool. we got on the docket today? Yeah, I just uh, I wanted to just kind of kick this off with, uh, I've been using uh, GitHub Copilot and chat GPT for more coding, like a lot more coding. And it's amazing. Which one's better? Uh, Copilot. Copilot's better because you don't have to leave the editor. And as you know, leaving the editor is just the worst. Yeah. Uh, I definitely had a magic moment where I'm like, just convinced it was random chance, but I, <laughs> I was editing a Swift program and I changed like the outputs of my Swift program uh, I have like this Swift program that we've talked about before that like generates a bunch of files using stable diffusion, like Apple's port of that. It's written in Swift and I've been tweaking that, um, which has been just fun and awesome. But anyway, uh, the way one thing they do is when they every file has like metadata attached to it. So they use a file name to store the metadata. So it's like value dot value dot value dot value dot jpeg and then you I just see. take the file name you split by dot and you can get the um the like the metadata. input okay yeah okay. kind yeah i mean it's yeah there's there's like the inputs with the things the machine used to generate that just you know it's like where do you stuff metadata oh let's just throw it in the file name um reminds me so, of ted <laughs> yeah yeah exactly hey, no, the names the, of this, our talks you know yeah yeah exactly you mess up like one file name the whole system crashes yeah 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 that's th this this uh this definitely feels a little like that um so uh anyway i edited that in swift there, there's been some updates to, to the ml stuff and um i got them added to my project just kind of through the metadata in the file name because that's how it was working before and uh, then I have a front end written in Next uh, 13 that basically looks at all this data and, and displays it in a UI. And um, because I added more metadata in dots in the Swift program, it had I was you know splitting by dot in the Next program, and it broke. And so I was like, oh yeah, I added like this strength parameter. So I just said like, okay, if my next program is looking at an image that had strength used, dude, right, I, said, I just did like if strength uh, ternary, like question mark. Not so, I did like strength ternary. Copilot completed the whole line and got the indexes of the dots right for the metadata I was trying to So extract. it like removed it from the thing? It just or... knew that like the metadata was like, in if order. I had the strength parameter, like the metadata that I was interested in had moved from like the fourth position to the sixth position. I see. And it just completed the whole thing. And I was like, there's no way. Like, there's just, that just has to be like random chance. Like, there's just some data in That's there. That's not something like, they would have learned from looking at other people's code on GitHub. I just, I, I I can't explain it. I just like wow. my mind, my like like my lizard brain is is just like that's just a random occurrence and yeah. like it's a coincidence and it just sticks with you. Um, but wow. it was amazing and it like completed the whole thing and I looked at it and I was like, oh my god, this is exactly what I needed. And it kind of hit me that like this is like the magic of Copilot. It's not that it writes your code. It's not that it's like. I've heard people say like I use GitHub Copilot and 
when it like auto completes stuff, I learn something new. Like I go over to Google and I type in the thing and I, I always learn something new. Mm. And I don't really find that. What I find is it, it just removes a boilerplate. It like keeps mm-hmm. your brain working and at flow. like that higher level right. of like, what am I actually trying to accomplish here? Right. And not, uh, and not just like, oh yeah. Having how to jump do you, down to the implementation. How do you split a, how do you split a, a string in JavaScript? What if you only need like two split groups and like it just eliminates all that. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, strong, strong yeah. recommend for me. And um, I'd used it before and, and I, I didn't like it because I thought it was just adding all this code to my code base. Um, but I found that if I'm, I've, I treat it, I treat it like an assistant, like someone that's right. sitting next to me that I can just say, oh yeah, how do you split a string? And it just, it gives you the answer, so. Interesting, man. Um, I haven't used it. So is it on 24 seven for you? Yeah, I'll like turn it off if I'm pairing because it is, it is distracting. That's uh, what I was gonna say next. The last time we were working together, I found it incredibly distracting and we just turned it off. So, so if there's multiple eyes looking at the screen and you know, you have stuff flashing, like I kind of like ignore it unless I need it to do something like mm-hmm. kind of the example I gave, like splitting the string and finding the pieces I'm interested in. Um, but yeah, I've paired with people that just start typing, like make a TypeScript type and they just do type and then they like auto complete the whole thing. It's like, well, yeah. wait, wait a minute. That's not yeah. the type of, that's just like a random type from their, their, internal thing maybe it matches right. but right um so yeah anyway uh yeah i turn it off when we're pairing and i would i would turn it off if i was recording a video mm-hmm. um, right but uh yeah it'd be really cool if like i noticed like when i go to like a prisma file and you do like anything you do like model recipe it's just going to have an answer for you there, right. but it's not going to be the answer. It's not going to be the right answer. Yeah, it's, it's, there's going to it's going to be off. It's going to get like ninety percent of it right, but it's going to be off by like one or two. So that's something where you want your brain at that higher level abstraction, right. where like you're the one designing, not Model. it. So like I, there's probably a way. Like I would definitely turn it off for Prisma. Right. Um, or at least I would turn off for certain words in Prisma so I wouldn't have it complete the model. But if I do like auto increment, I definitely want that part to complete. Right. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's all. Just wanted to share that, but uh, no, strong cool. recommend for me. It's just like super strong recommend. I'll have to give it another shot. I, I feel like I, I personally just am e- easily distracted um, with stuff like that. Like super easily distracted. I always need my like environment to be pretty clean, you know, and I don't have notifications on like any device. That's just that stuff is important to me to get in the flow. I feel like it'd be nice to have like a keyboard shortcut to, like you were saying, find the substring of this. Like just get the date from this date time stamp and like. I maybe do that in a comment, press command period, and then like then GitHub comes in. I'm sure you can do that. Yeah, I have I have not looked at the settings and I don't I don't know what's available or, or not. But yeah, that, I think that would be nice. Yeah. Cool, man. So yeah, let me talk about this uh, YouTube video I'm working on right now. I'm um I'm building a toggle, like a switch, like you would see in the settings of like an of, of iPhone, you know? And um a toggle is semantically like a check checkbox in HTML. And the headless UI libraries like headless UI and Radix and other ones for a while now have basically made something like a switch component available to you, um, which has the same semantics as a checkbox, which adds ARIA roles to the markup um, so that all devices treat it like a checkbox, both assistant devices, but also keyboards. You can tab to it, you can press space to toggle it on and off. That's always a good practice if you haven't used these headless UI libraries before. Basically every control in your app can probably be represented as a kind of root native HTML form input. Um, And it's good because they work so much better across devices. But people want to make up their own markup and design and so they try to do that with the native elements. It's really hard and so if you try to make an HTML input type checkbox look like the switch in iPhone, it would be like impossible. So the headless UI libraries are perfect for that. They give you a renderless switch, which has all of those correct attributes and the behavior and the keyboard shortcuts, but you get to render your own markup and style it however you want. And so um, React Aria is a library that's not quite a headless UI library, but it gives you hooks that are lower level than a higher level switch component 
that you can use to build up those things. But React Aria is like incredibly comprehensive and they, they have thought about basically everything you can think about. It's like the basis for Adobe's like web UIs, I think. And it's maintained by um, folks who work at Adobe. But it's always been a little harder to use um, because of that reason. It's like supposed to be these low level hooks that let you build really robust high level UI components, but it's more wiring. I have a question. If you were gonna build a headless UI library, would you use like React Aria under the hood? Yeah, so that's exactly so like what they just did basically. So if you oh, were gonna okay. build a headless UI library, you could either use headless UI or Radix and just kind of customize them, you know? I mean, I guess if you're if you were gonna build a headless UI library, yeah. yes, you, you would not build it on top of those. You, you would, but you would build it on top of these hooks. That, that would be a perfect use case for it. That's one way to think about React Aria is that libraries like Radix and Headless UI decompose into these things, right? So recently they just put out React Aria components, which is the equivalent abstraction level of a Radix or a Headless UI, and it is built with the hooks underneath, um, but, but they're still headless. Uh, but they have all the kind of robustness and features of of the hooks. Now, Headless UI and Radix have, have a lot of features and there's obviously a lot of overlap, but um, there's some really cool stuff in Aria and it's pretty neat now that you, you don't really have to make a trade-off. Um, and if there happens to be something that's missing from the components, you can always go down to the hooks because it's like part of the package, you know, and that's what they're built with anyways. So they work well. They give you ways to like escape it, you know, because like there's custom behavior you would want at, yeah. at some point or events or something like that. So uh, I was looking at this. They have a really cool page where they have like 16 components style with Tailwind as an example, which obviously I loved to see. And um, I had used React Aria before. I had this YouTube video where I rebuild like the iOS calculator and like the main cool interaction there is like the button press, you know, and there's lots of nuance and detail to it. If you tap it, it should kind of glow and fade away. If you tap and hold and move off, like it should unselect without like scrolling the website. You know, they have this big blog post that was going around last year about how to build a button and how hard it actually is. And all of that stuff is encapsulated in this use button hook from React Aria. Anyways, I got a lot of practice with that building this calculator. And it made me remember, I was like, I want to build a button. I just never got around to it, but I was like, I want to use this. I want to get a headless version of this button built with like the use button and the use press stuff on all of our websites because just all the things you never forget remember to do like user select none so that if you click and hold like on a phone it starts selecting the text of the button if you click and drag try to cancel it by dragging off it just it just scrolls the whole page all of these weird things um and also even just being able to style the canceled state and then go back on to it um right because usually we use hover for that kind of thing with a mouse pointer but on a touch device, you can't do that. So he's thought about all these things, put it in these hooks, and now there's this alpha release of React Aria components, and it's just badass. And so there's this page full of like 16 components that were styled with Tailwind, and I wanted to take a look at the switch immediately because something that's been in the back of my mind is um, all of these toggles and switches that you've seen, Radix, Headless UI examples, they, they are, there's this one little feature of the, of the interaction on iOS, which I always loved, and um, which those never had, which was when you are in an active state, you want it to kind of grow. And also you can cancel it. So this is like very intuitive. Anyone who uses an iPhone would know this. And then like, it's funny. We just kind of, we just lower our expectations when we come to the web. And like, I would never tap and hold something and cancel it on a website because I know like the whole thing's gonna freak out. I'm probably gonna zoom in the page, start selecting text, you know, but it should do that. And it turns out it actually feels really good to do that uh, with a mouse pointer as well. And I knew the hard part here was that we have active states. There's a few things here. We have active states, active pseudo states in CSS so that, you know, you've probably seen this. If you have a button, you, you click on it when you're pressing it. Sometimes it goes down. It's a really nice feeling. It feels like you're pushing it. But that's inconsistent across browsers. It also doesn't really work well on touch devices. And this is like the whole reason for use press, which is like this unified interface for like this thing is being pressed, whether by a keyboard that's holding it down. That's another thing that the CSS pseudo class doesn't always treat um, consistently. You're holding, you're pressing the keyboard button, um, but you're you're not fine repeat keyboard events. 
you're pressing the mouse or you're touching on it. Use press gives you a pressed state that you can style. And um, use use press is from React Aria, right? Yeah, it's a hook. And that's what I use to build my calculator app. And so I basically, for all these reasons, never went through the effort to do it with the toggles and switches that I would be using from these other libraries. But it was always kind of in the back of my head. So as soon as I saw this, I went to the switch demo and I tried it. I tried to press on it and move off of it and move on it. Now he didn't style the thing, but I could just tell, I could just tell the button because he had some like, I think he dimmed it a little bit when like you, like you pressed it. I could tell it was using, you know, use press or use button or whatever mm -hmm. underneath. And I was like, oh man, I'm excited. So I basically instantly whipped up a demo and wanted to rebuild the iOS slider. And that's kind of what I've been working on this week. And I'm going to release a YouTube video on it this week. And um, it's dope. It's so easy. Basically, there's a switch component uh, in this React Aria components library. And um, instead of using CSS pseudo states for all the reasons we talked about, it's built under the hood with things like use focus and, and use press. Focus is another thing that's treated inconsistently across browsers and, and, and unpredictably across mouse and touch devices. And I was like, I know he's using it. So I popped open the dev tools, hovered over, pressed, uh, focused it. And basically what he does is he adds data attributes on the root switch. So this in combination with the arbitrary variance that landed like after like the JIT engine and Tailwind became standard sometime a year or two ago is like the, it's just perfect because Basically, your root headless switch gets all these data attributes telling you whether it's pressed or focused. And also selected, of course. It gives you another one for selected. <laughs> and it's so funny, man, because like a couple of years ago, we've been like data attributes, right? I, That's such dude, a ghetto talking, way to do I just things. had the exact same time. Like we're back in the jQuery days of using right? data attributes. But the thing is we have the whole, the, the other layer below us is exactly. just perfect. Exactly. The tailwind with the arbitrary variance makes all the difference. If you did this before you had that, it would be painful. You wouldn't do it. You would just want state. You want conditional classes. And turns out you can actually do that because they render a render prop, which is pretty dope because I did a version with frame or motion, but they do a render prop with an object with all of the pressed focus selected states wow. right there. So, I mean, it's awesome, man. You could use that to kick off like a check animation with frame or motion. You could do all sorts of stuff. So again, they've, it's, it is a good time to be a friend developer, man. Like if you're listening to this and you n never tried to do this stuff five years, even five years ago, I mean, it is, this is just like, you could not ask for better APIs here in terms of just how they compose together. It is just, it is awesome. Um, so cool. basically if you, the same way you can, everyone who's used uh, tailwind has probably done something like hover colon background blue 500. The way you use arbitrary variance or uh, uh, yeah, arbitrary variance for data attributes is to do data dash, and then you use bracket syntax. That's the arbitrary part, right? Because there's no standard on which data attributes are like a standardized, and so Tailwind can't provide them for you. But the bracket syntax, the square bracket syntax, is how you pass an arbitrary CSS selectors or values through Tailwind's kind of engine, just in time engine. So what you do is data dash square bracket, and then you can do selected close square bracket colon. And now you can apply styles if that current element has a data selected attribute on it. Now the, the one last key to this is that the switch is renderless, right? So the root capital S switch that you render from React Aria components is the thing getting all of the data attributes. But when we build the, um, the toggle, we have like a, a little bit of markup inside, you know, we, we do the outside, um, uh, rounded rectangle, and then you do the knob in the inside and you have shadows and then you move it and all that stuff. So you want to style those based on the data attributes and the parent that's perfect for, um, using a group from tailwind. So if you, if you slap a group on the parent, now you can do group dash data dash square bracket and, and target any one of those data attributes. Um, and uh, that's it. That's all the piece of the puzzle. I made it so that when you press it, the width of the knob grows. When it's selected, you nudge it left by four spaces on the four units on the, on the spacing scale. And then when it's to the right, you grow it again. And uh, 
basically that's all you have to do. And now I can click on it, I can press it, I can move my mouse off and it cancels and it shrinks again. And I pulled up on my phone and it's the same thing. You can press it and it grows and then it lets go. And because you're animating the margin, once you go to selected, if you just tap it, right? You use data pressed to grow the knob and data selected to switch it from the left to the right. And so now if you just tap it, it smoothly animates over, but if you press, it grows to give you feedback, right? That you've pressed it and then feedback if you've canceled. So uh, <laughs> it's pretty freaking slick, man. I've, I've, I have two questions. First, uh, the, when you went to go pull up the phone, did it just work or did you have to like start tweaking stuff? So I made it a little bigger because it was kind of small. Um, no, it works. There's a little, there's a little thing with like when it switches over that I want to try to fix just a little bit like the, I think it's just the animation curves or something. And then the only other thing I have left to do is if you tap a button on iOS and start dragging the screen, it's, it's not going to move. Um, and I thought that was part of use press, um, or like use button, the hooks, mm. because you want to be able to cancel it in the same way you would on iOS, but on a web page, it starts going to web page and I, mine didn't do that. And I was like, why is that? That's surprising. Turns out use press is used in more applicate in more areas than just this, something like this, uh, similar to a button. And so they didn't want to bake in the body scroll locking behavior into the hook but you get the attribute that you can use to basically add that. And so, so I need to add like user select none or scroll, what, whatever the thing is. Devin, the guy who maintains the library just, just replied to me this morning. So I just need to add that. That's going to be part of the video, of course, but that will prevent the, uh, the page from scrolling when you drag. Cool. This might, that you might've just answered my next question, but it's, you kind of started this where there's a component library, which provides a headless components, the data attributes, the render props, but then there's also this lower level React Aria that provides the hooks. Did you, were you able to build this thing using the headless UI? No, I, I know headless UI is another library. <laughs> were you able to build this thing using the headless version that I, that I like the headless abstractions, or did you have to drop down to the, the hooks? No, you would be able to build this. It would just be a more work. No, no, but for for your video, do you stay in the headless side or? Do oh yeah, stay in the headless side. To the, oh, it's all the, React Aria components. Oh, it's like three lines of code. It's unbelievable. It's literally cool. the headless component, because again, it it just it has the press behavior baked in because it is a component that you press, and so that's that's what I was so excited about because I was like, I keep wanting to do this. I keep seeing weird parts of the site when I, that we we make or any project I use and I use on my phone or. You know, you start dragging and you're selecting text. All that stuff is taken care of. And um, that's what's so exciting about this. So these are built with use press. They give you all the goodies from React Aria, but it's all packaged up nicely in these like extremely high level components that give you the data attributes you need, which are super easy to style with Tailwind and give you render props if you want to do fancy stuff with frame motion or you want to change the, the text based on some React state. Yeah, cool. I think it's I think it's exciting that I know I you're excited about a vision use with yes. Right. You're excited about use press because you because you know it and you've been using it for a year. But right. when I when I hear that stuff, I'm just like I'm oh God, my, here comes eight hundred <laughs> lines of my component that yeah. like I'm gonna have to maintain. But the yeah. fact that I th I think the exciting thing here is that the fact that you're able to build it without using use press, without using right. those hooks, you just exactly it's freaking beautiful, dude. It's it is it is awesome, and it just it fe it feels really good. Um, yeah, I just pulled a tweet here. We just set user action none in the CSS. Um, so that's that's the property user action none to get it while it's being pressed. I don't exactly know how to wire it up yet, but while it's being, I think it would maybe it's just on the button. So maybe it would just be a new data group dash data dash bracket pressed colon user action none and that should do it so um pretty cool really man. cool yeah. yeah so i'm really excited cool. about that that video is going to be going out uh, this week very cool yeah and there's lots more like this this could i could make videos on this for the next month like easy there's like date pickers i think it's uh the first headless date picker of any of the libraries because it, date picker is such a complex um, UI component to make it 
as accessible as the default input type date picker that you would render. And they have like a used date picker or some used thing. Maybe the date picker is like a combination, right? Some of the examples in React Aria are like five hooks. Oh, you need to remember to do this and this. You have yep. to press it. You have to show it in a modal. So you have to render it in a dialogue, whatever. This is like a high level calendar headless thing. So pretty cool. Cal uh, keyboard shortcuts, you know, and disabled and cycling through all this stuff. I would love to make a, a calendar um, with that and uh, animate it with frame motion, just like we do in our calendar video on Build UI. Yeah, I think that uh, that would be an awesome Build UI course. Yeah, building a calendar. Yep. Also, too, I I mean, seriously, <laughs> one out of every five apps I work on has a calendar. Even if it, the app has nothing to do with dates, eventually you get some billing screen or something that just needs to have a calendar select. Yeah. Um, so it'd be cool to to see you build that. Definitely. I think building Airbnb's calendar with React Aria components and Framer Motion would be awesome because we know the resizable panel part. We know the 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 different months, rendering it, animating it. Each It's an infinite calendar. That's what we do in our course. And uh, then it's just getting the keyboard shortcuts, making sure Ooh. it escapes and opens and you can, and then the constraints around, you know, all, all that stuff yep. um, would be a lot of fun, so. Data fence too, which is yep, awesome data fence. Yep, great library. So, yeah, man, pretty cool. Um, and it's just cool. Like the, the whole headless thing again is just brilliant. If you wanted to do like an embedded calendar, like Savvy Cal or Calendly, you would still use this, right? It's not. It's not a calendar component that pops open a widget in the middle of your screen. It is a headless component that yields out everything you need to build any calendar um so if you look at something like calendly you could build that you should build that with a headless version because it would behave the way any user would expect any calendar to on any device that's like the that's the key part it is uh just like stepping back it is interesting how just over the years like you get the jquery UI calendar widget that's basically you just take a div and call dot calendar on it and it just boom just draws yep. a full calendar and then we go to like these headless components and we go to the use components that you build it's just interesting how we're like pathfinding our way to the, the the perfect set of tools that will work with every app but you can still be productive in as a developer that's that's all it it is no it's it's fascinating and so many developers are going to want to just use something like a jQuery calendar because they're busy, they need to add a calendar and they're gonna do it. Especially because browsers didn't even have support for input type date until a couple of years ago. I mean, I think I That's did some point. YouTube video like a year ago and input type date worked on Chrome but not like mobile Safari and this was like a side project I use on my phone. So, you know, then you're still like, gosh, like kill me, right? And it's like, this is not the main part of your app. You just want to be able to put in a date and not screw it up. So you're going to reach for something that's that's super easy. Now that HTML has gotten so much better, you know, for example, the remix course we're doing right now, we're building a work journal. You you add a date to an entry, and so we just use input type date picker because or date because it's great. It works great. It looks great, but it's not like a themed. It's not part of the themed app. Like if you were making Airbnb, obviously the calendar is a huge part. You wouldn't want to just let the browser or the device do whatever it does. So personally, for me. I know a lot of devs aren't like this, or maybe they're in a situation where they face a constraint, a deadline, this thing needs to just work, but this is like a scope thing that gets cut. I basically either go browser default or kind of like headless, basically. Um, and there's some in the middle now where it's not even in the middle, it's still browser default, but things like Tailwind and Tailwind Forms plugin have made it a lot easier to make good looking default form inputs. But that is definitely the way to go if you are not willing or able to invest the time and effort to use the headless stuff and make it work well. Um, but that's that's how I go these days, you know. Like for example, like the the on my fitness app, you open it up and you like choose your goals. That's an important thing. That's like a radio. So I use like Radio Group, and like I wanted control over the design, and I didn't want it to have the little circles with the shadows the way the browser does it. I wanted it to feel like it was part of the app because it's a core kind of user flow. So I use headless UI radio for that. Um, and, uh, and 
and, and also like the cost of doing that now is so much, so much less with these libraries than it was five years ago. And so that's why another reason why people reach for things like jQuery calendar. So the trade-off curve is definitely being bent. No, no question about it. Um, maybe the best, maybe, and, and this is where it's nice to, to have when, when these libraries have examples of just kind of good defaults, like a good, a well-designed default calendar to use with this. It's going to be a lot of markup because it's headless. You're still rendering all the stuff. It's going to be way harder than jQuery.calendar. But if it's using tools and technologies you know and are familiar with, like Tailwind, like React, then you can just paste it into your app. But now you can change it if you need to, which, again, for folks like us, is a much better situation than having to change the title of the week or start it on Monday or Sunday and having to go to jQuery calendar documentation and figure out what weird API I call. That's that's another part of the thing that brings down the, the yes. cost curve is yes. that, you know, every time we copy a Tailwind UI component into our app and we want to change it, I that's it. I, I don't go back to the documentation to figure out what API they've given me to change or if they've given me an API to change the background, you know, because um, it's all right there. So. So all those factors are definitely bending the trade-off curve here. Cool. I, uh, just from working on products, one of the things I appreciate most about what you just said is that if it's core to the app, you take the time to invest, like the calendar, if it, like the Airbnb calendar. Right. If it's not core to the app, like maybe, yeah, the example I gave, like a date picker on a billing page, you just do the simple browser version. Uh, I like that because it, it, it eliminates like a whole line of like, bike shedding on uh extra work for like product level stuff where it's like yes we will absolutely invest in this for the airbnb calendar but for the other calendar nope yep. we're just fine with this I, I really i like really like mental hacks like that yes that just let you make a decision quickly yes and move on i know that there's like it's ultimately like a giant continuum but yeah. i think that's one of the things we try to do when we build totally apps. it's like Ab pick absolutely one get as many in the defaults as possible but if it's like something that's really important to the app like we don't feel guilty about investing in exactly it. so yeah and and it's really important i think to have a principle like that especially for form inputs because they're so easy to screw up select example <laughs> is a great great example and again dude we had all this happen all the time to us at ted and you want it to look good with the rest of the stuff and the select field the select input the native select input was hard to style for a long time again tools like tailwind and tailwind forms make it so much easier to look like it belongs in the form and only once you click it now you are using the native browser ui so maybe safari is going to show you like a gray thing with a shadow and a blue highlight and that doesn't match your brand but you're walking down a dark road if you say every time we need to select we have to go full custom and match every menu in our app because open that thing up on your phone and it's going to be so much better for that person again unless you are willing to take this long time right there there are apps yeah. where the select menu is a core part it's a core ux ui element of some core flow and um you know so that, that's that that's where you'd want maybe you use a range slide or whatever a wheel or whatever right but um by default you can get it looking great with just native inputs and a, and a little bit of resets and um like tailwind styling or, or whatever library you're using you know so very cool cool Awesome, man. You want to talk about cookies? No, let's wrap it. 30 okay. minutes. Good. Cool. Yeah, I just want... Yep. Awesome. I'm excited to make this video. And I'm excited to make... Uh, we're going to post an, a, another Tailwind video this week. And um, the Remix course is in a fun spot, too. We've been creating entries and reading entries and grouping them. And um, we're starting to think about what is going to be next for Build UI. And course-wise, you've got some React Server component demos you're working on. And... Um, It'll be exciting to make some next 13 content once the app directory stabilizes too, because a lot of folks are talking about that. We're excited about that. So that's definitely on our radar as well. Yeah, we're, we're super pumped about that. Uh, one more thing about your, um, we're gonna have a recipe for your 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 switch, right? So people can yep. play with it. Cool. Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll add that to, I'll add that to um, the show notes for this episode, for this podcast episode, because this will be out next week and the video will be published by then. So um, yeah, I've, I've started to, make easily cop copyable share uh, 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 code snippets for the, these kind of micro demos I make for my my videos. And um, I think that's like, that's an easy way to get it if you don't want to 
watch me actually build it, but you just want to use it. So um, definitely check the show notes for that. Cool. Awesome. All right. Hey, good week. Good episode. Let's keep it up. <laughs> All right. See you, man. Thanks for everyone for listening and uh, talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.